If you were here last Sunday, you will remember that we were in Ruth chapter number one where we concluded with Ruth and Naomi arriving in Bethlehem after such loss occurred for both of them in chapter number one. In fact, I hope you'll recall that last Sunday we ended sort of envisioning uh, Naomi returning to Ruth, now her young Moabitish daughter-in-law with her, and that they were standing in Bethlehem at the top of the slope, and that they were looking down over these terraced fields of grain, that the grain, the, the, the stalks of grain might have been waving in the air, and, and they were looking there at this arrival time when they made it back to Bethlehem. In fact, chapter 1 and verse number 19 tells us that they made it there and they arrived at the beginning, verse number 22 tells us, they arrived at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now these two women, Naomi and Ruth, are standing there at the gate of Bethlehem having lost absolutely everything. These are two women for whom life had been far greater, far worse than disappointing. It had been absolutely devastating. Both of their husbands were dead. Naomi's two sons had died. They have lost it all. In fact, when you look at chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, this is Naomi's admission. It's her estimation of her life. I have nothing. Verse 20, she says, do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara which means bitter, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Do you see verse 21? I went out full, but I came home again. The Lord brought me home again empty. Her own estimation is, I've lost everything. My life is utterly broken. But we actually know when we get into chapter number two that she did have one thing. She had something. Look at chapter two, verse number one. It begins with these words. And Naomi had a kinsman. There you go. She wasn't without any hope at all. She had a kinsman. And so chapter 2, verse number 1, enter Boaz. Let me introduce you to Naomi's kinsman, Boaz. Have you ever met him? Everybody? This is Boaz. Boaz, this is everybody. Here, I want to introduce you to Boaz. He is, the Bible tells us in verse number 1, the kinsman, a relative of Naomi. Now, the passage tells us in chapter 2, the first few verses, it gives us a lot of information about Boaz. Look at verse number 3. Verse 3 tells us that Boaz was a landowner. So he's a business owner. He, he's operating a business, and his business is in growing and harvesting crops, wheat and barley, and so verse number three tells us that there is a part of the field, the fields of Bethlehem, which belong unto Boaz. In fact, Boaz didn't just own one field or one little portion of a field. If you look at chapter two, verse number nine, it tells us that he owned multiple fields. Because in chapter um, 2 and verse number 9, he has to instruct Ruth on how to find the right field to be in. So, so uh, Boaz is a businessman. In fact, he is a successful businessman. Chapter 2, verse number 1 tells us that he is a mighty man. Now, what does that mean, a mighty man? Well, the word mighty means heroic. Another way to say it would be he was famous. He was he was well known in Bethlehem and in the region. He was, verse 1 tells us, a mighty man of wealth. No doubt, part of the reason that he was so well known in Bethlehem was because he was so successful in Bethlehem. His fields had yielded greatly. He had managed his business well. He had many servants. And he was a successful and wealthy entrepreneur. And then we learn, as I mentioned in verse number one, that he is a relative of Naomi. Verse number one says he was of the family of Elimelech. So he's a relative, a kinsman of Naomi. Now, you should understand that he is not simply a distant relative. He's not like the third cousin twice removed. In fact, skip over to chapter two and verse number 20 where it tells us in the middle of the verse, Naomi said 
unto Ruth, this man, Boaz, is near of kin to us. So he's a closely related uh, kinsman. In fact, at the end of verse number 20, she says, he is our next of kin. So he's related to them. He is closely related to them. And verse number 20 says, he is one of our nearest kinsmen. Now, what you should understand is that Boaz and his relationship to Naomi, and in fact, his relationship to Ruth by marriage, Boaz is crucial in his relationship with Naomi and Ruth, crucial to their future well-being. In fact, you're going to see Boaz beginning in chapter 2 and all the way through chapter number 4. He is going to be the one that's going to make all the difference in their lives, okay? Now, before we jump into the text, there are two things that I need to point out to you, two provisions of Jewish law that are at work in chapter 2 that if you don't understand them and you just begin to read the chapter, some things are going to be confusing to you. So let me point out these two provisions. Write them down. The first thing that you see at work in chapter 2 is the provision of God in his law for a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer. That is that the nearest kin of a person would play the role of a redeemer in that person's life. The Hebrew word for redeemer is goel, goel, and it is a word which means to redeem or to buy back. Or here's a way to say it, the rescuer. And this person would typically be the brother, the eldest brother of a person, but if that relative was dead, then it would be the next nearest relative. The way that the kinsman redeemer provision worked was this. Maybe you'll jot this down. It was to say that any duty which a man could not perform for himself had to be taken up by his next of kin. This is outlined for us in Leviticus and in Numbers and in Deuteronomy, this law of a kinsman redeemer. Here's an example. If a person in Israel were to have to mortgage their property to pay their debts, and they kept mortgaging and mortgaging until they were overwhelmed, upside down in debt, and they were losing their property, or if they had to enslave their children to pay their bills, they couldn't pay the, the money, so their children had to go to work as servants for their debtor, uh, or if the whole family became indebted. In such a case of poverty, it would be the responsibility of the goel, of the redeemer, to buy back the property that they had lost or to pay to have the family set free from slavery. It was the responsibility that they would provide that redemption for their family. There's another element of this uh, kinsman redeemer law that you'll see as we get into the next couple of chapters of Ruth, and that is the law of leveret marriage. And some of you are familiar with this. This is where if a man were to marry, and then he would die without having a son, then it would be the responsibility of his redeemer, his goel, his brother, to marry his widow, and then to raise up children to have a son with that widow so that the name of the deceased brother would continue on and would not disappear from the land. It's called the law of leveret marriage. That's what we're actually going to see happen in, uh, as we continue on in the book of Ruth. So this is the provision in God's law of the kinsman redeemer. We'll get into it in more detail next week, but just know that that's at work here. The second thing, jot this down. The second thing that you see at work in chapter number two is, the, is a provision in the law as it relates to gleaning. Uh, gleaning. In fact, uh, you, it'll be a good uh, bit of homework for you to go through chapter two later today and to circle, count the number of times that the word glean or gleaning is found in chapter number two. It's there over and over and over Again, in fact, 12 times in 23 verses, every other verse, chapter 2 talks about this law or this provision of gleaning, and it relates to the poor. So hold your finger in Ruth for just a minute and go over to Leviticus, just backwards a few pages, to Leviticus chapter 19. Let me show you where God instituted this provision in his law. Leviticus chapter number 19. 
while you're turning there, do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 26 and verse number 11 when he said these words, the poor you will always have with you. Remember those words? The poor you will always have with you. This has always been the case. There have always been in every economy, in every society, uh, indigent people, people who were poor or who are needy. And because of that, God made provision for the poor in his law. Are you there? Leviticus 19. Look at verse number 9. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, Neither shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. Neither shall you glean your vineyard, or, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave those things for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So here's the provision within the law. God said to those who are working, those who are producing, those who are harvesting, that they were to leave some of what they were growing, producing, or harvesting, they were to leave some of that so that the poor and the stranger or the alien, the foreigner, could be taken care of. Now you'll notice in verses 19 and 20 that there are three provisions in this law that are given. The first one, he simply says in verse number 9, Verses 9 and 10, I'm sorry, not 19 and 20. He says in verse 9 that you are to not consume everything that you grow. So when you plant your field, you plant the whole field. You plant rows all the way into the corners. But when it comes harvest time and you begin to harvest the rows, he said, I want you to round off your field and leave the corners. Don't harvest into the corners. That's, that's the first generous action that they were to take. Now, let me apply that to us. Here's, here's the command. He says, don't consume everything that you get. We need to learn this lesson in America in these days. Because here's what most people in America do, and most Christians do this as well, is that we set a standard of living, wherever that is, and then we work, 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 to let our production reach the place where it can support the lifestyle that we've set, the standard of living that we've, that we've agreed to. And what do we do usually when finally we reach a place where our production, our income, surpasses our standard of living? We raise our standard of living. And now we're behind again and we have to work, work, work to get, to get our, our income up to sustain the new standard of living. Here's what God says, don't do that. God says, determine that you will live below your means so that you will then have corners, you'll have margin, you'll have surplus so that you can be generous with that surplus. If y'all understand, shout amen. amen. This is what God says that we are to do. He says, don't consume everything. Number two, the second generous action. He says, don't pick up the gleanings which you drop as you're harvesting. Now, they would harvest these um, stalks of wheat or grain. They would take the sickle. They would cut them off at the bottom. They would gather them in bundles, much like we would do corn today. They would gather them in bundles and bind up the sheaves. And of course, when you're doing that, you're going to drop some. There'll be some laying in the, in the path behind you. God said, don't pick them up. Leave them. Whatever you drop, leave them so the poor can come along and they can pick those up. And then in verse number 10, he says, same principle, but now not in the field, but in the vineyard. He says, in the vineyard, do not harvest every grape. Leave some grapes on the vine. And whatever you drop, don't gather up the gleanings. Don't pick up the gleanings that you drop. Leave those behind. The corners, the gleanings, some of the grapes, these are for the poor and the stranger or the foreigner. Leave those for them. Be generous. Now, you may say, you may ask, and perhaps they would have asked as well, why would we do that? We're the ones working hard. We've earned our living. We deserve it. Why would we do that? Here's his answer at the end of verse number 10. Because I am the Lord your God. <laughs> You're my people. 
And my people should be generous people. Loved ones, let me challenge you. Live with generosity. Don't consume everything, but live in a place where you have some generosity. I've told you this before. One of the greatest things I've ever heard about this is this. Every person is born stingy. We are. Those saints serving right now in the two-year-old nursery are learning that by experience. Because they're hearing, mine, mine, I want to give it to me. Because we're all born stingy. But every one of us should be born again generous. Because our Heavenly Father is generous. He said, I am the Lord your God. So this is why you should do this. You know, in every, in every culture, in every economy, there are gatherers. People who plant and labor and work and invest and harvest. And then they gather what they've worked to, to, to grow. And in every economy, there are gleaners. Gleaners who just pick up what others have produced. And maybe for all of us, at some point in our lives, we're a gleaner, right? I mean, maybe for, we, we might all be in a place where we need some help. Where we have to p- just pick up what somebody else has produced. But you don't want to live as a gleaner forever. You want to be a gatherer. You want God to give you grace. And you want to work hard to become a gatherer. So this is the provision in the law of gleaning. Now, Ruth goes to glean. And some things you should know about that are these. Number one, Ruth qualified to glean. Did you see verse 10 of Leviticus 19? He says in that verse, these things are to be left for the poor and the stranger. Well, guess what? Ruth qualified on both counts. She was poor and she was a foreigner in this land. And so when she goes out to glean, it is absolutely appropriate that she is doing that. The second thing that I would point out to you back in Ruth chapter 2, and if you're not back there, go ahead and go back now. Ruth chapter 2 points out that the owner, in this law of the, of the gleaning, the owner had discretion. In other words, the owner could let the poor and the stranger into his field as he decided which ones he would let in. This was not a free-for-all. This was not that anybody could come traipsing through your garden and take anything that they wanted. Look at chapter 2 of Ruth and verse number 2. Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go into the field and glean ears of corn or grain after him in whose sight I shall find grace. She couldn't just go into any field. But she had to go into a field where the owner of that field would say, Yes, you're, you're, you're allowed to come in. You're welcome to come in. This was not forced redistribution of wealth. This was people given a law by God. They were compelled to obey that law, but they were the ones who would determine how and who would be allowed in. Perhaps they were following the proverb of Proverbs chapter 3, which says, withhold not good from them to whom it is due. And maybe there were some some that came in and wanted to glean, and the owner said, no, 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 you're not coming in. You can go, go find another field. But Ruth came, and she found grace. She was allowed in. You with me? Third thing to notice about this is that in God's economy of providing for the poor, that God made it clear that the needy were required to work for their benevolence. They were required to work. Look at what the Bible says in verse 2. Again, let me go glean. I want to go work in the fields. Verse number three, Naomi said, yes, go, glean, go work. Look at verse number seven. When Boaz comes and asks the foreman, who's this girl? Who's this woman? The foreman says, this is Naomi's daughter-in-law, the Moabitess. She's been working all day from the morning until the evening. She's been working hard, so hard she had to rest, that verse tells us, for a while. And in verses 20 and 21, when she gets home in the evening, Naomi says to her, where did you go to work today. Do you see this? The needy were required to work. If y'all are listening, shout amen. Now, Ruth didn't say, Naomi, you got a piece of cardboard? I'm going to make a sign, go sit at an intersection and just do like this. No, that's not in God's economy. You said, wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to be generous and, and give, and we are. Absolutely. And God said, There are some people to whom we should give and require nothing of them. Who are they? 
Orphans, widows, lame, blind, people that can't help themselves. But nowhere in God's economy does it allow for, provide for perfectly able-bodied people who just refuse to work to hold their hand out and say, put something in my hand. That is not wrong if you do it, but it's not a biblical command that you must do it. Y'all with me? I got three amens. Should have been more. No, God said, you, listen, you need to work. All right, so this is the law of gleaning. Now, you, you understand the law of the kinsman redeemer and the law of gleaning. With all of that background, let's, um, let's read the text beginning in verse number one, Ruth chapter two. I'm gonna read the whole chapter. It's 23 verses, so hang with me. We'll read it and go through it quickly. Verse number one says, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go, my daughter, go. And so she went. And she came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap, the King James says, by chance she landed on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, the foreman, Whose damsel is this? And um, the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, Well, this is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she asked, I pray you, Let me glean, may I glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And so she came and she has continued even from the morning until now. She only tarried in the house for a little while. And then Boaz speaks directly to Ruth. Boaz said to her, listen to me. Hearest thou not, my daughter, listen to what I'm telling you. Do not go and glean in any other field. Neither go from here, but abide here fast by my maidens, my servant girls. Let your eyes be on the field that they do reap in, and you go with them. I have charged my young men that they would leave you alone. They should not touch you. And when you're thirsty, I want you to go to the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in your eyes, that you should take notice of me or knowledge of me, seeing that I'm a stranger? And Boaz answered and said to her, Because it has fully been shown to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your nativity. You've come to a people which you didn't know before. May the Lord recompense your work and a full reward be given unto thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. You should underline that statement. She had come to trust under the care of the Lord. Verse 13, then she said, may I continue to find favor in your sight my Lord, for you have spoken compassionately or comfort, comfortingly to me, and you have spoken friendly or kindly to me, even though I am not like one of your handmaids. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come here and sit with us, sit at the table, eat the bread, and dip your morsel in the vinegar. And so she did. She sat at the table with Boaz and his servants. He, Boaz, reached or served her parched corn and she did eat and was filled. And when she left, when she was risen up to go glean again, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves. Do not rebuke her and let fall also some handfuls of grain. Drop it on purpose for her. Leave those things there that she may glean them. Do not rebuke her. And so she gleaned in the field until the evening and she beat out or threshed that which she had gleaned. It was about an ephah of barley, about four gallons worth. And she took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she brought it forth and gave it to her mother-in-law, what she had saved for her. And her mother-in-law said, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed is he that has taken knowledge of you. And Ruth showed her mother-in-law with whom she had worked. And she said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord. God bless him. 
because he has not left off his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said unto her, or, um, and Naomi said unto her, the man is of near kin to us, one of our near, uh, next or nearest kinsmen. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said, He said unto me also that I should keep fast by his young men uh, until they have ended all of the harvest. And Naomi said unto, her, uh, Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maidens, that they meet uh, not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. And she dwelled with her mother-in-law. And all God's people said, Amen. It's a great, great text. I want you to jot this down somewhere if you're a note taker. This passage expresses to us, it's so beautifully, I think, the mystery of grace. When I was reading this this week in a fresh way, I was, I was touched by the, the mysterious working of God's grace. In verse number two of this chapter, Ruth states what is her greatest need in life at that moment, really at any moment, but certainly in this moment, it is the greatest need of her life and it's the need of grace. Do you see it in verse number two? She says, let me now go into the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose eyes I shall find grace. That morning she said, I'm gonna, I, need, I need somebody to show me grace. And then if you'll skip down to verse number 10, after Boaz is so kind to her, she says to him, bowing herself down before him, she says, why have I found grace in your sight. Now watch this. In the morning, she said, I need grace. In the afternoon, she said, I found grace. And why did she find grace? Well, look at the answer in verse number three. She found this grace from Boaz because, the King James says, it was her hap to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz. When the word when the Bible says hap, it was her hap, it means it just so happened. Some people would say, isn't she lucky? She landed in the right field. Or some would say, well, that was fate. She, she landed in the right field. It means just by chance, it just so happened this way that that's where she went to glean. She didn't know Boaz. She didn't know of his relation to Naomi. Naomi had not mentioned Boaz to her. She just goes out. She knew that she could glean. And so she goes out into all of these fields, walking down all these paths. And it was her hap to land in the field of Boaz. Now we know that it was neither luck nor fate, nor did it just happen. It was the grace. Do you agree? The grace of Almighty God directing her. She's just going along, you know, and she's thinking, well, there's a lot of fields. I'll just go here. And then she turns in, maybe I'll go down here. Well, here's the field. And so she just ends up, because of the divine guidance, the mysterious working of the grace of God. Let me say this to you. We all live in the mysterious working of the grace of God, where he is directing our paths on days and in ways that we don't even understand that he's doing it. The rest of the book of Ruth, what will play out in chapters three and four would have never come to pass had she landed in somebody else's field. She may have gotten grain for the day, she may have had plenty to eat, but all of the good gracious things God had planned for her couldn't have happened if she had landed in any other field. She was experiencing the mysterious grace of God. And I would suggest to you that the grace of God in Ruth's life did not just begin on that morning when she went out to glean. In fact, I think you would agree with me that we could say that God was gracious in unseen, mysterious ways in the life of Ruth from the day that she was born, even before she was born. A Moabite girl living in a pagan country, but born to parents who happened to move their family into a particular part of Moab where mysteriously by the grace of God it would happen that a man named Elimelech would move his family, migrate from Bethlehem, and they would look for a place to settle in Moab. And where would they settle? Right in the same area 
where Ruth lived with her parents. And somewhere along the way, maybe in Moab Central High, she met Malon, and they became boyfriend and girlfriend. And by God's mysterious grace, he let her marry this Jewish boy. And then it was God's grace that when Malon and his brother died and Elimelech died, that Naomi allowed her to go back to Bethlehem with her. It was the grace of God that drew her heart, even when she didn't know it, even when she didn't understand it, God was drawing her heart to put her trust in him. It was the grace of God that morning that put her in Bethlehem. It was the grace of God that morning that guided her steps as she went down the path and the rows and the roads through the village there outside of Bethlehem until she came into the field of Boaz. You understand? God was directing her path all along her life. And I would even say, spoiler alert, by the way, spoiler alert, it is the grace of God that allowed her to land in the field of Boaz so that ultimately she and Boaz would get married. And some of you who haven't read ahead went, they get married? They got married. It was the grace of God that allowed her, a widow, broken, foreign, pagan widow, to marry a successful, wealthy Jewish man and have a son with him named Obed. It would be the grace of God that would let Obed grow up and get married and have a son named Jesse. And it would be the grace of God that would let Jesse grow up and get married and have a son named David. And the grace of God that would make that David grow up to be the greatest king of Israel. And so it was the grace of God that when you get to the New Testament, you read the book of uh, Matthew, the book of Luke, and you read the genealogy of Jesus and you find the name of Ruth in the lineage of the Savior of the world because the grace of God guided her step all along the way and she didn't even know it. I love it. It is the grace, the mysterious grace of God and you live under it. You experience it. You don't even know it. But God has taken tragedy and turning it for triumph. God has taken circumstances and directing them into his will. God is making relationships and making connections and directing your path exactly where he wants you to be. Can I tell you that for, for Jim Dykes, the, the mysterious grace of God in my life that is that's quite honestly one of the most profound for me is second to my, to my salvation and my family, second to those things, The greatest grace privilege in my life is my association with Brookstone Church. The fact that God lets me pastor and lead this church in this season in our our days is the, the amazing grace of almighty God. And I didn't come looking for it. I didn't submit a resume. I didn't know about the church and want to go find it and submit my job application. Do you know how I became the pastor of this church? Do you know how this happened 34 years ago? Two old guys, both of whom are in heaven now. One old guy knew me. He was friends with an old guy who didn't know me. I'd never heard of this church. And I'm telling you the truth. Those two old guys went and had coffee at McDonald's one morning. And old guy number one said, the old guy that knew me, y'all should get little Jimmy Dykes to come preach for you. And 34 years later, God's grace allows me to be a part of this church. It's grace. It's grace. I see in Ruth, and I'm so blessed that we get to live under the mysterious grace of God. He's always working. The second thing I want you to see in this passage is the manifold goodness of God. That God was good to Ruth, and he was good to Ruth through this man, Boaz. Can we agree together? Can we say it? God is good. And all the time, he is Ruth comes home, verse number 18, that first day of gleaning is finished. She comes walking in. she got four, four gallons of grain. She sits it on the table, and Naomi says, where did you go? Who, whose field have you been gleaning in? And she said, ah, some guy I met. He's really nice. His name's Boaz. And Naomi must have been like, Boaz? You mean Boaz is doing that well? You mean Boaz is still living? Boaz is a near kinsman to us. And all through the night, she explained to her how good Boaz had been to her. Verse number 20, Naomi says, God bless Boaz. Look at it. Because he has not left off his kindness 
to you, to the living and the dead. He has been kind. The word kindness that's translated there, the word that's translated kindness is the word chesed, chesed. And it means, it's translated often of God, his loving kindness. It simply means his goodness. And I think you'll agree with me that Boaz was good to Ruth, wasn't he? In a lot of ways. Look at verse number eight. He said to her, when, when he met her, he said, listen, my daughter, don't, I, I want you to hear me. Listen to what I'm telling you. You're at, you're at home in my field. My field is your field. Don't you ever go glean in another field. You stay right here. He said to her in verse number nine, he said, I'll always make sure that you're satisfied in my meal. When you get thirsty, Ruth, then you come to where the young men, my servants, have drawn up some water and you drink it. And she may have been like, I'm a foreigner. I don't even know them. I'm a, I, they, they wouldn't let me have a drink of their water. He said, you come and you drink water. I'll make sure you've got water. And when you're hungry, you come sit at my table. What? I, I just wanted to glean and I'll slip out and go home. No, 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 no. You, my table is your table. You come sit at my table. Not only was she to sit at his table, he says, you will sit with me. Look at verse number 14. When she's sitting at the table with the reapers, Boaz serves her a dish, a parched grain. He says here, and he reaches across and serves her. He says to her in verses 15 and 16, or not to her, but he says of her to his servants. She goes back into the field to work and he looked at his servants. He said, hey guys, here's what I want you to do. As you're gathering up the sheaves, I want you to drop some, just on purpose. Just gather them up and go, whoop, oops. Gather up some, oops, oops. And she'll be coming along behind you thinking, these are the sloppiest harvesters I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he said, I want you to drop a few on, uh, on purpose. And then verses 21 and 23, so amazing. He said to her, you, you're allowed to glean, not just today, not just tomorrow, not just this week, not just next week, not just next month, but you glean here Every day until the harvest is completely done. You stay here. Boaz is a type of God's goodness, our redeemer, isn't he? Of how good that God has been to us. How we've experienced the chesed, the loving kindness and the goodness of God. In fact, Psalm 36 and verse 7 says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Remember, she had put her trust in God. And she experienced his chesed. And so have we. Like Boaz to Ruth, God has said to us, you're at home in my field. You're accepted in the beloved. He has said to us, you'll always be satisfied here. If you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. He said, you'll always be full here. You'll always be satisfied here. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. He said, you will sit with me here. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. You will have all that you need here. I will drop handfuls of purpose. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory and you can stay here forever, he said to us. Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We all live under the mercy of God and we've all experienced the goodness of God. The final thing I want you to see in this passage as we close is Ruth's response to this grace and this goodness. Look in verse number 10, how she responds to Boaz. She says to him, falling on her face, bowing herself to the ground, she says, why have I found grace in your eyes? Why have you taken knowledge of me? I'm a stranger. I'm estranged to you. You don't even know me. Why have you been so good to me? And she asks him, why have you been good to me when I'm not even, I don't even measure up to your servant girls. I'm not like them. And by the way, this is the response of every person who has one little inkling of the goodness and the grace of God. None of us walk around going, yeah, I deserve that. Man, God's lucky to have me on his team. All of us say, God, why would you be so good to me? I'm such a stranger to you. I am so unworthy. Why would you be so good to me? And Boaz said, the reason I've been good to you is because you've trusted in the Lord. And this is the reason that God has drawn us through his goodness, that we might trust in the Lord. Let me take you back to close to chapter 1 and verse number 22 where... 
The Bible says that Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem empty, broken, and bitter, empty-handed. But they, become, they, they arrive in the beginning of the barley harvest. Chapter 2, she meets Boaz, experiences his hesed, his goodness. Three months pass, she gleans every day, she has all that she needs. In chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, at the end of the harvest, three months later, there's a little chill in the air, the fields are wiped clean, the barns are filled, and I envision Ruth standing in her kitchen. One chapter ago, she was empty-handed, a pagan stranger, knew no one, had nothing. Now she stands in her kitchen. Her pantry is full. Her mother-in-law is, is well. And I envision her saying, God has been so good to me. Boaz has been so good to me. I've experienced Hesed, the goodness of God. And she probably thought, you know, I got here three months ago with nothing. Now look, I've got everything And then she probably thought, no, not just that. God was good to me back in Moab. And God was good to me in every step of my life. And I just didn't know it. And here I am. And I just think, if it had been written, she might have sung that song we sang a moment ago. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so faithful. So good. And so with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. God's been good. Amen. And if you know him, we ought to worship him. 